So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, this talk is going to be an introduction to OWAM, Oblivious Swam. Uh, Oblivious Swam is a technology which was first, you know, this designer introduced more than 20 years ago, but received a lot of popularity in recent years. Uh, I just described the basic constructions of Oblivious Swam. First, the initial constructions from 20 years ago, and then three base constructions from last years, which seem to, seem to be uh, very promising. And I also uh, talk a little about how to use uh, Oblivious Swam as a model for uh, secure computation. So I assume that many of you already know about Oblivious Swam, but for those who don't know, it should be actually a nice, gentle introduction to the concept of Oblivious Swam. So the setting is the following. We have a client and a server, and the client is somehow limited, so it wants to store data at the server. Okay? So the client has a small, secure memory, and the server has a very large but insecure memory, or the server is untrusted, and the client wants to store data at the server. And the server could be a server farm or cloud storage, you know, any setting where the client is, uh, is small and weak and the server is much more powerful. So it can be a client working with a cloud uh, computer. The initial motivation was that the uh, client was uh, a CPU, which has some limited number of registers in hardware inside the CPU. And the server was a RAM memory okay, that uh, uh, CPU wants to access. Uh, and that, actually, that's the uh, motivation for the name uh, Oblivious RAM. And OK, so this client can store, say, a constant number of data uh, items and also, uh, say, a counter. It has to count up to n, so log n bits. And the server can store n data items. And data items are, say, blocks or files. It could be pretty big. Now, suppose the client wants to uh, keep the conf confidentiality of its data, so it can definitely encrypt the data to prevent the server from reading it. So there's no chance of the server reading the data, and if the client uses uh, uh, semantically secure encryption, so even, even if the client stores two copies of the same data, the server, server will not be able to identify it. Another thing the client can do is it can MAC its data so that the server cannot change it. So that's also useful. But suppose the client also wa wants to hide the pattern with which it accesses the data. So it doesn't want the server to learn which items the client has accessed. So for instance, suppose in one interaction, the client accesses the items numbered 1, 2, 3, and 4. In another interaction, it accesses the, numbers, the items numbered 1, 2, 2, and 1, or just say access item number 7 four times. It doesn't want the server to learn which items were accessed in each interaction. And the reason is that uh, by uh, no learning which items were accessed, the server might learn a lot about what the client is doing. Okay? So we want to hide the uh, pattern of accessing data. Now, we, okay, of course, if you want to uh, uh, provide some security, we should define what we want to achieve. And for Oblivious Swarm, it's defined, it's defined in the following way. So suppose the client wants to store n data items at the server. Each data item has an index and a data block. And uh, they should all be of uh, the same size. Otherwise, the server will identify them according to their sizes. Okay? And then this client performs a sequence of uh, read-write operations, n read-write operations, denoted uh, by y. And the access pattern that the server sees during this uh, uh, read-write operations uh, it sees which uh, indices at the remote storage are being accessed and which data is read and written to uh, the remote storage doing uh, uh, these accesses. And, and uh, an oblivious RAM is secure if for any two sequences of, of data accesses, the server cannot identify which one of the two uh, sequences occurred. So assume that in the first sequence, the client just accesses the, first, the, the single item all the time. So it does you know, n accesses. In all of them, he reads uh, block number one and writes it back to the server. Uh, and in the second sequence, he just keeps, you know, reads a random set of blocks, but the same number of blocks. And Oblivious RAM is secure if the server cannot distinguish between these two sequences. Okay? Now, it's easy to hide the contents of the data by encrypting it and say each time the client reads the data, he can re-encrypt it okay? and store it again at the server. So that's, that's easy, but we want to hide which items were read from the server. 
Okay, so what do we achieve if we, okay, what do we have to do if we want to achieve uh, Olam, oblivious Ram? So obviously the client must have some private source of randomness, otherwise the server can uh, emulate whatever the client is doing. Uh, the da data also has to be encrypted with a semantically secure encryption system, otherwise the server will notice that the same data is stored over and over again. Uh, another thing is that whenever, if you want to hide from the server whether we read or write the data item, then every time we access the server, we must both read the item and write it back to the server. So each time we read an item, uh, we might re-encrypt it with uh, fresh randomness, so the server won't be able to identify that it's the same item, and we must write it back to the server. And then for the server to not be able to identify that we're reading the same item again and again, then the location in which the item is stored, uh, location in which item with index i is stored, should be independent of the index i. And in particular, if we access the same the item, an item with the same index twice, these two accesses should not necessarily be to the same physical location at the server, okay? So and though, although the client is keep reading the item with uh, like index i, each time it reads it, it should access a different location at the server, okay? Otherwise, the server will notice that the client is accessing the same item. Uh, so what can we do if we have an oblivious RAM? So it's related to uh, complexity theory uh, results about oblivious simulations of theory machines. Uh, the initial motivation of Goldrich and Osofsky, who were the first to uh, uh, work on this, was software protection. So there, as I said, the client was a CPU with some registers, and the server was RAM program. And they wanted to hide which items are read from the RAM to prevent reverse engineering of, of the programs. Uh, today, we're talking about remote storage in the cloud. It can also be useful for search on encrypted data. Uh, by using oblivious RAM, we can prevent cache attacks, like those showed by Evan Tromer and his colleagues. But it's like a, a huge overkill to prevent cache attacks. And OAM can also be used for secure computation. I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Now, there's a trivial solution for achieving uh, oblivious RAM. That is, each time the client wants to read an item from the remote storage, it just reads all n, all n items, reads them over to them, gets all n items back to his no, local uh, uh, memory, uh, reads them one by one, decrypts each one, re-encrypts it, and sends it back to the server. So then every time the client wants to uh, access an item, it has to uh, physically access n items at the server. So the blow up is a factor of n, and this is obviously inefficient. So we'd like to achieve a much better uh, blow up. And at the end, the best techniques achieve, achieve a blow up of factor of, of log n with very small constants. So I'll start describing the techniques. Uh, the first two techniques are from the paper of Gordon and Ostrovsky. I, I, cite here the uh, uh, journal version of the paper, which uh, uh, supersedes some previous versions. And these are really nice techniques, because I'm sure that anyone who sees this problem for the first time is quite surprised that anything like an efficient uh, oblivious RAM is, is possible. And the basic tool that these uh, 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 techniques use is oblivious sort. And oblivious sort does the following thing. The client stores n items on the server, encrypted, and then the client wants to sort them according to some index, okay? But he wants to do the sort so that the server doesn't know what happened. So to compare each two items, okay, compa a comparison of two items can be done uh, obliviously. The client, which has a constant size memory, could read both items to its local memory, okay? Uh, decrypt them, compare them, maybe reorder them according to which item is, 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 is larger, we encrypt the items and send them back to the server, okay? So comparing two items is, is easy uh, to be done uh, obliviously, but the client would like to sort the entire items and the, the, all the items, and the problem is that the server sees which items are accessed by the client. So let's think about sorting algorithms. So an oblivious sort is one where the sequence of comparisons is independent of the input. It's, 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 it doesn't, doesn't matter what input you have, okay? The sequence of pairs that the client wishes to compare is independent of the value of the inputs. So if we think of the basic you know, sorting algorithm, I guess the first one that everyone learns, a bubble sort, then that algorithm is, is oblivious. Because we just you know, scan the items and compares, compare pairs of adjacent items. 
So uh, it's an oblivious sorting algorithm. That's, that's great. So the client will just read, per, will read two items, decrypt them, perhaps reorder them, encrypt them again, and store them back. The problem with that approach, with that algorithm, is that the overhead is not optimal. It's n square. Then the next algorithm that we learn, uh, quicksort, which has you know, great performance. Uh, the overhead is n log n, but if you think about how quicksort is implemented, it's not oblivious. The decision about which items to compare depends on the results of previous comparisons. Okay? So quicksort is efficient, but uh, it's not oblivious. And actually, a great way to do oblivious sorting is using uh, sorting networks. So sorting networks were designed, I guess, in the 60s, give or take 10 years, and were actually designed for, you know, to be used in hardware to, to sort data or, or sort telephone calls. Okay? So in these networks, we have a basic primitive, which is a comparison, uh, which compares two values and decides to either reverse the order or not based on the result of the comparison. And a sorting network tells you, you know, which items should be compared and which, in which order should the items be compared in order to sort them. So I guess in, in this, in the left example, first the top and the third item should be compared, then the uh, second and fourth item should be compared, and the order might be uh, uh, reversed or not based on the results, and so on. And there has been lots of work in the, uh, you know, in the past on how to implement them efficiently. Okay, so the basic operation is comparing two items. The client can do it uh, uh, privately by reading two items and encrypting them. And luckily, we can we use the results from a few decades ago on how to do it efficiently. So there's the well-known Batcher sorting network, who, uh, which can do uh, this sorting in n uh, log square n comparisons. And then there's the AKS network that uh, compares sorts item in n times log n comparison, so it saves a factor of log n. However, the constant is much larger. So the constant of the uh, AKS network is something like 6,100. So it's more efficient than the batcher comparison uh, sorting network if n is greater than 2 to the 6,100, which is obviously not the case. So therefore, we might as well use the batcher uh, sorting network. Uh, the it's very small. It's very small. Right? Uh, Michael used it. It's, it's like uh, less than 10, I guess, like much smaller than 10. Uh, OK, another option is randomized shell sort. So OK, it was developed by Goodrich in uh, 2009. So shell sort is an algorithm, a sorting algorithm developed by a person called Shell. And it's oblivious because the, I the decision of distribution of the items that are compared is independent of their values. And randomized shell sort works in order n log n, so it's as good as, good as the AKS sorting network, but with a very small constant. However, it's only uh, correct with high probability, not, not always. And when I give numbers later, I just use the uh, sorting networks, not the randomized shell sort. OK, so I was asked if the probability of error is negligible. So I'm not sure here exactly, but something which is kind of different in all the results I'm going to talk about here is that whenever you do hashing or sorting or data structures, and whenever people in that area write you know, with high probability, they don't mean with overwhelming probability. So the uh, probability of things going wrong is not negligible. Sometimes it's 1 over n, sometimes it's 1 over n squared. And sometimes it's, it's very hard to read the paper and understand what is exactly the probability of things going wrong. Okay? So many of the results in this area are kind of cheating according to our terms because the uh, error probabilities are much higher than we're used to. However, in many cases, they do simulations and they don't encounter any, any problems. That's actually like an interesting like, uh, uh, research question is to go over the algorithm, see what is exactly the error probability, and see if you can improve it to be negligible. OK, so I'll start describing the algorithm. So the first one uh, is the square root O1. Uh, and here, the overhead of accessing an item will be square root n. So to access an item, we'll have to read square root n items from the server, OK? Instead of reading n items in the uh, uh, basic scheme, and assume that n is a million, so we'll only need to read order of 20 items from the server. It's, it's no, no, order 1,000, but still it's much better than a million. OK, log is 20. OK, so here are how it goes. So the first step is the initialization. So suppose we have 
M items, we store them at the server, encrypted. And we also include uh, square root of N dummy items. And we also put aside uh, space for square root of N sheltered, sheltered words. Now we just store the data at the server. Uh, the next thing we want to do, we want to permute it. Because we don't want you know, item I to be in location I. So what the client does, it selects a random permutation over the integers from 1 up to 5 up to m plus square root of n. So basically covering the basic items and the dummy items. Okay? And it moves item number i to location pi of i. Now how can the client move item number i to location pi of i obliviously? So remember, the only tool we have is uh, uh, oblivious sort. So what the client does, first it scans the item, and then next to item i, it writes the, you know, the value pi of i, okay? And then it takes the, me no, the, the memory that was changed and sorts the location of the items according to the indices pi of i, okay? So first it does a single scan, writes pi of i, which is the future location of each item next to it. Then it does a, a, a sort, okay? And the sort, Okay, we sort the items which have indices from 1 to, pi of, uh, to, to n plus square root of n. So item, an item with an index pi of i will be moved to location pi of i because pi is a permutation. So that's a very neat way. And actually what these algorithms, uh, the only thing they do is, is oblivious sort over and over again. So we permute the data. And it's implemented using oblivious sort. And now suppose the client wants to access an item whose, whose uh, uh, index is i. So the first thing it does, it scans the entire shelter to uh, find the item. So we haven't put anything there, so the shelter is still empty. But still the client scans the shelter. Then if the item is, is found in the shelter, the client should hide from the server the fact that the item was found in the shelter. So the client just uh, looks for the next dummy item. So if it's the jate time, we're looking for a dummy item, and the dummy items were in location m, m plus 1, and so on, the jate dummy item will be in location pi of m plus j. So the client can compute that because he chose pi and he knows m and j. So it just goes to that location in memory and does a scan. Obviously, he won't find him anything interesting, but he already found the item in the shelter. Otherwise, if the item was not found in the shelter, then uh, it should be in location pi of i. Item i should be in location pi of i. So the uh, client goes to that location and reads something from there. Uh, so notice that in both cases, the client goes to a random location in uh, the storage at the server. And he'll never go to the same location twice, because pi is a permutation. And he'll never access the same you know, pi of i twice. <laughs> OK? Uh, actually, it's not yet clear, but you'll see in a minute why. And then the last step, you know, after we read the item and perhaps we updated it, we want to write it back to memory. So we write the item back to the shelter. So item num the it read that we did, we're going to store it at uh, location i in the shelter. Okay? So then suppose we want to access that item again, then we'll scan it. When, when we we'll do the scan over the shelter, we'll immediately find it. And then when we uh, will do a read of a dummy item here. Okay? So suppose the client wants to access number, item number one over and over again. So in the first time, he'll find it someplace in the main area of storage. In the next time, the item number one is going to be in the shelter. He's going to find it, then he's going to look for a dummy item in the main area. In the third time, again, he's going to find the item in the, in the shelter. Again, he's going to look for uh, a random uh, item in, in, in the main area, and so on. OK, so the algorithm seems OK. And the important thing to note is that Whenever we, okay, whenever we read an item, we write it back to the shelter. No matter if we want to change it or not, we have to write it back. And we should hide where we're where, where we writing it, so we'll go over the shelter. Okay. So we have to do square root of n read and writes over the shelter. It can be optimized, but all the over, obvious optimizations don't uh, change the overall you know, order of computer, uh, overhead of the protocol. OK. So there's an obvious problem. So the shelter is a size square root of n. So after square root of n read and write operations, the, the, the shelter is going to become full. Okay. So what do we do then? So what we do then, we, we uh, update the storage and we promote everything again. 
So after square root of m uh, accesses, the shelter is full. And then we move items from the shelter back to the permuted memory. Okay. So what should happen here? Suppose we read a certain item. So the old item of the the old version of the item is the, in main memory. A new version, or perhaps new, several new versions of the items, are in the shelter. So how can we move the items back from the shelter to the main memory while hiding what we're doing? So okay. So the only tool we have is this oblivious sort. Okay. So I guess what the client can do is sort the items according to the uh, identities. So if a certain item, we have a copy of that item in the main memory and another copy in the shelter, or many copies in the shelter, after the sorting, they're going to be adjacent next to each other. Then the client is going to scan over the memory, okay, identify duplicates, and uh, just keep the newest one, okay, because the newest one is the one coming from the shelter. Okay. And then I guess it will uh, like to permute the memory using a new permutation pi prime. But it can do that by scanning the items, uh, attaching to each item the new location of that item pi prime of i, and then doing another sort. And I guess you can improve what I said here by some you know, constant fraction, but that's, that's basically what they do here. So as long as we assume that we can do oblivious sorting uh, for free, everything here works fine. Okay. And the overhead of sorting using, using batcher network is OM log square of M. So what's the overhead? So each time we access an item, we have to read the entire shelter. This takes square root of M uh, items that we have to read. Uh, after square root of M IO operations, we have to sort everything again. Uh, the overhead of this using the network is order of M log square of M. So the amortized cost is square root of M times uh, log square of m, which is much smaller than, uh, than m. And the nice thing about this system is that it's very, very easy to implement. And there are almost no hidden constants once you have the, uh, the, sorting, uh, the oblivious sorting algorithm. And there was actually implementations of this, uh, you know, of this scheme like 10 years ago, and they were pretty efficient. Uh, much more efficient than implementations of the next scheme, which I'll show you next, which I'll show next, that has a, a polylog overhead compared to the uh, square root of m overhead we have here. What about security? So, if we recall what we do here, what does the client, what does the server see? He sees whenever the client accesses something, the server sees a scan of the shelter. It's always the same scan then accessing a new random location in the main memory, then a scan of the server. So it's completely oblivious of which item the client wanted to learn. And then once in a while, there's an oblivious sorting you know, process, but it's also oblivious because it's an oblivious sort. So whatever the server sees is independent of the actual data. OK. Uh, it's there. You can write an easy simulation proof. And I, I, I kind of described it here. You can simulate the view of the server. Do a scan, then access a random you know, item at the main memory, then do another scan. That's the simulation proof. Yeah. And then assuming that the oblivious sort is, uh, is oblivious, but it's also easy to show a simulation proof to be, to be oblivious sort. Every time you do it, you have to change the communication. Yeah, so after each square root m accesses, you have to change the permutation and do a new sort according to it. OK. So uh, Gordon Henosovsky didn't stop here. And they came with a, you know, amazing solution, which has only a polylog overhead for each access. OK. So I'll describe this solution uh, next. So what they do, they store the data items in levels, and level number i is going to have two to the i buckets. So we're going to have a total of log n levels. Okay, Each level, level i, has two to the i buckets. Each bucket could store log n items. Okay, They also associate a hash function per level. So it's at the bottom here. Uh, hash function i maps values to one of the two to the i buckets of level number i. Okay? And this hash function is chosen by a client, kept secret, and he can compute it. And the invariant is item x is located in one of the levels in a bucket hi of x. 
So either in the first level in bucket H1 of X or second level in bottom H2 of X up to uh, level log N in bucket H log N of X. So we know it should be somewhere there. And each bucket could store log N items. Uh, another uh, envir an environment we're going to have is that level I, which has two to the I buckets, can store at most two to the I items. Okay? Uh, so this means that if we use a random hash function to map the two to the I buckets, items to the two to the I buckets, then with high probability we're going to have at most log two to the I, which is smaller than log of n items in the most popular buckets. Okay? So this means that having buckets of size log n is, is sufficient because with high probability we will not overflow items in the space in a bucket if we make them log n, no, log n items big. Okay? And high probability, it's not really, well, depending what you do here, it's not really exponentially small, but it's, no, the error is not exponentially small, but it's, it's good enough. Okay. Uh, and as I said, uh, the buckets are of size log n to make sure with high probability that they do not overflow. Okay. So how do we access an item? So essentially, okay, for the first level, it's so small, we can just scan the entire level to find if it's there. Then for each other level, uh, okay, for level number i, we look for it uh, where it should be, okay? So if we haven't yet found item x in one of the levels which are above level i, we're going to look for it in the location where it should be in level i, which is hi of x, okay? If we already found x before we got to that level, we're just going to put uh, pick a random bucket in level I and read it and look for uh, item X there. We know it's, go it's not going to be there, but we have to pretend we're searching for something to hide from the server the fact that we already found the item. Okay? So we start going in the, uh, this layered data structure, going from the top to the bottom, looking for item X in a uh, uh, bucket HI of X. Once we find but item X, we just look at random buckets at uh, the uh, uh, layers below the layer where uh, the item was, was found, okay? And if we found the item in more than one layer somehow, uh, we'll know that the most updated value of the item is the top one, so we'll use the top value that we found. Okay, then we have to write the items back. So what we do after we found the item, we're going to write it back to the storage, and we're going to store it at the uh, top level. So hopefully there's room in the top level. It's gonna, not going to last for long because it's a very small level, and we're going to write it there. And if the item already exists there, we rewrite it because we have a fresh version of the item. Okay? So of course there's a problem here. Uh, each time we look for an item, we end up writing something to the first level. The first level is of constant size, maybe size 2, maybe we kind of optimize the first level of size, say 1,000, but it's of constant size. Okay? And at some point, it will become full. And then we have to do something. So we have to start moving items from higher levels to lower levels. Okay? So we, this is called the reshuffle. And the idea is like this, like this. So level number i will store at most two to the i items. Okay? It has two to the i beans. Okay? Uh, all of each of these beans has log n space. But we're only going to put two to the i items there. And, and one thing we want to do, we want to hide how many items are in each bin. So we're going to pad each bin with dummy items to, hand, to hide you know, what's the number of uh, real items in a bin, what's the number of dummy items in a bin. Then after two to the i steps, we know that level number i is full, probably reach its capacity. And then we're going to uh, mix or reshuffle the contents of level i and level i plus one, the one just below it. So we're going to reshuffle the items and move all of them to level i plus 1, OK? And it's going to hold that level i and level i plus 1 together will always have 2 to the i plus 1 items. So let's think about this, OK? So say we have a level with four items and with eight items below it. So after four iterations, the level well, we started this, this, the process. So we started everything empty. After four level, four steps, the level with four items is full, the level with, level with eight items is empty. Then we move everything from the 
top level to the bottom one. So the level of size four is empty, and the level of size eight has four items. After another four steps, so it's step number eight, we again have four items at level number four. Again, we move them to the level which has eight locations. Now that one becomes full. But remember, now we're at step number eight. So at this point, we move the items from the level which has eight positions to the level below it, which has 16 positions, and so on. So it's easy to show that we always, has, always have room for the items in, in, in each of the levels. We never get full. And what does the reshuffle process uh, do? So it must empty the contents of level i, move it to level i plus 1. If the same item appears in both levels, then we should only keep the most updated one, the one which comes from the higher level. And afterwards, we should reorder level i plus 1 using fresh randomness. So the way items are match, ma mapped to buckets using this hash function h, uh, we should reorder them using a new hash function h, which the client can store. OK, so how can we do this? Again, using uh, uh, oblivious uh, sorting. So the clients, uh, one way to do it is to store the contents of both levels based on their IDs. OK? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, when you when the same item is in the same level, yeah. the newest copy is at a lower level than It's a, a higher level. The, a lower index and a higher in the, in the drawing, yeah. So when you move it to the, when you copy it, do you it or? Okay, so what happens is that, you know, suppose I read a certain index at some point, point in the past. I didn't overwrite what was written in that location, so it's, it's still there. And then I, 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 I wrote the updated version up in, in, in the top uh, layer, and then it starts going down. At some point, I'm going to, suppose I read the, uh, that item from level no, 10, at some point I'm going to mix the contents of level 9 and level 10, and then I'm going to have two copies of that item, the old one and the new one. And at that point, I want to get rid of the old one and just keep the new one. OK? So you always do this moving at 2 to the i, right? At 2 to the i, yeah. So from level 9 to level 10, I do the moving at you know, times which are 0 modulo uh, 512. OK? So the way I do the reshuffle, I do a, a sort of the contents of both levels, OK? And now, if there are two copies of the same item, one coming from the higher level, one from the lower level, they're going to be adjacent to each other. So I'm going to do a scan of the data. And if I see you know, two adjacent items, okay, I remove the old one and keep the uh, new one. Okay? And I, by removing, I, I don't want to show that I removed anything, just replace it with the dummy. Okay? Then I, knew, I use a new hash function to assign new bins to items. I sort according to the new hash function. Then uh, it might be that to a certain bin, I moved less than log n items. Actually, that's the usual case. Then I add dummy items. I do another sort or two. Each one of you can, you can fill this. You can sort this out for yourselves. And, uh, and you can finish the whole process using sorting operations. And you can somehow optimize this. Uh, and, and, and that's the process. OK. And this is to scan and adjust the number of dummies so that in each Bucket, we only have log n items. OK, uh, so how much do we pay? OK, so, okay, so let's look at the uh, second line here. So we shuffle of level i. It takes a constant number of sorting operations. So it takes 2 to the power of i times log square of 2 to the i log n. Uh, yeah, I think that's, yeah. That's at least the bound on the cost, which is order of 2 to the i term times log square of n. Now, think of, you no, know, suppose we have n items. The lowest uh, uh, level had n items. The one on top had uh, n half items, and so on. After n IO operations, the lowest level was uh, sorted once, OK? The level above it was sorted twice, and so on. So for sorting the lowest level, we paid n times log square n. For sorting the uh, 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 level above it, we paid twi uh, twice a cost of n over 2 times log square n, and so on. And we have a uh, log n level, and this all sum up, sums up to n times log to the power of 3 of n. Okay? So the amortized cost of a lookup is therefore uh, log to the power of 3 of n, because this is basically the number of, of, of 
uh, the, the cost for doing uh, end operations. But this was tru truly amazing, I guess. Uh, and what about security? So the view of the server is easy to simulate, okay? So what does the client do? It scans the entire first level, that's always the same thing. Then it reads a random bucket in each layer, okay? This takes a bit more, I mean, to, uh, you should look at it more carefully and we call it when I described the, uh, the read process, then I said that if the item was already identified in one level, then in, in lower levels you should look at random buckets, not at buckets corresponding to the hash of that item. And, and this property ensures that each uh, read involves reading random items in each bin, and then storing an item in the first level, and then just doing the reshuffle, which is moving data, storing the, uh, sorting data, and doing linear scans, and all of this is oblivious and easy to simulate. So the security actually is not hard to, to, uh, uh, to prove. The, the only way where security breaks is if the hashing breaks, okay? If somehow the hashing maps more than log n items to one bin, okay, then the system doesn't know how to handle this. We don't have room for more than log n items in a bin, okay? Uh, so in that case, everything breaks. Either we uh, ignore that item, so in this case, the, the oblivious RAM erases some item which would, it was supposed to store. In some cases, it's not a problem. In some cases, it is a problem, okay? Or another option is for the client to say, okay, I chose the wrong hash function, let's do it again with a new hash function, okay? With high probability that the next, uh, 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 the next try will be okay, but that's not good. And, and why is that not good? Why can't the client tell the server that the hash function was not good and somehow it, it mapped too many items to, to the same bin? Yeah, and, and the answer is that as this reveals information to the server. If the client tells the server, actually I'm not sure if it reveals information to the server because the hash function is, is, is secret and it's unknown to the server. Um, so let's keep this as a, I won't try to solve it now. Okay, so we won't try. In, in other cases, it reveals information, I'm not sure about this case. Um, <laughs> Everything is oblivious, so let's go on. Okay, and what are the costs? So the server stores n times log n items. Okay, it has this tree structure, but we store a bucket at each location, so it's n times log n items, okay? And the constants are not very small, they're not very big, but they're not very small. Uh, another thing is that the amortized cost of only log to the power of three n uh, operations per IO uh, uh, accesses hides a very high worst case, okay? So in the worst case, suppose we just finish uh, uh, writing the end, uh, doing the end IO operation. In that case, we have to sort all the levels, including the lowest level, okay? And uh, uh, sorting the lowest level takes n times log n uh, operations. So the uh, worst case here is order of n times log n, which is quite high, okay? and it might be come at a time which is most inconvenient to the client. Uh, but there are solutions doing it uh, more efficiently. Uh, if we replace Badger with AKS sorting network, we can achieve, you know, we can sh uh, shove a, shave a factor of flow gain from the overhead. Also, if we use uh, 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 the uh, randomized shell sort. And actually, there are many versions for this protocol, like not many, but some versions which improve different aspects of it. And this part of what I showed is definitely not the end of, of the story. But I just wanted to show the, the basic ideas. Okay. So um, that result of Gordon Henosovsky was kind of, uh, you know, state of the art for almost uh, two decades or say 15 years. And then a new result came, which kind of changed the, uh, it was very surprising. So the result of Goldach and Oskowski, well, it wasn't the state of the art because there were improvements, but most of them followed the same, the same hierarchical structure, okay? And the new tree-based ORAM is actually way simpler than the Goldach construction and achieves better performance. 
So it was very surprising to see that result. Okay. So these are results which are very competitive and very simple to implement. There are actually even implementations of them in hardware. Uh, I mean, there are many papers. The one, the two papers uh, listed here are like the most you know, prominent, important papers. And the authors which are in the, in the section of these two uh, papers are Emil Stefanov, uh, Stefanov and uh, Elaine Shi. Okay. Uh, and we'll only describe here the most simple scheme of tree-based OR. Okay. So uh, tree-based OR stores the item in, in, in a tree, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and it's going to be a full binary tree. Uh, and it's going to have okay, log n levels, n uh, leaves. And each node contains a bucket with room for log n items. Okay. These buckets with room for log n items keep, keep appearing. Now, for now, let's assume that the client okay, maps the items to random leaves, okay? And it keeps uh, a position map where it stores uh, uh, the location to which each, each item is mapped, okay? So the client keeps uh, essentially an index saying, say, that item number zero was mapped to uh, location, leaf actually number three, item number one to leaf number two, and so on, okay? So this seems like cheating because the client has uses O n storage. It has to use to store uh, n indexes, okay? But I have two answers for that. The first is that, uh, like in a few slides, we're gonna read, read, get rid of that. And the second answer is that actually even this is a huge improvement because the client wants to store n data items. Each one of them is, might be quite big. And now it only has to store n indexes. Each one of them is only leg log n bits long, OK? So the fact that you save by storing this at the client, when I mean, you store okay, log n instead of storing a block which might be, I don't know, a megabyte or a kilobyte uh, uh, bytes long, OK? So even just using this, you know, uh, this uh, 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 solution. So in this solution, obviously the client uses O n space, not a constant amount of space, but it's much better than storing all the data items in the client. So for now, assume that the client stores this position map. And then the invariant we have here is in, that an item is stored somewhere on the path from the root to the leaf to which it is mapped. So item zero in that position map that I showed in the previous slide was mapped to leaf number three. So it's going to be stored in one of the uh, locations, though, in the path from the root to leaf number three. Okay? Unclear where, but it should, should be somewhere on that, on that path. Okay? Now, suppose we want to access an item. So the client reads each of these nodes in the path from the root to the leaf. It reads each one of them, you know, item by item, okay? It can read them. It de decrypts the uh, values, okay? And in each bucket, it decrypts all the values in the bucket and looks for the item, and the item should be there, okay? Someplace along, the, along this route. And when the uh, client identifies the item, it removes it from, from that uh, bucket, uh, and it just stores like a dummy item instead, okay? And then he said, OK. And so it, it does the read from here to you know, all the way here. And then after it kept reading, uh, after it read all the items along the path, it assigns a new uh, random leaf to the, to the data. So if before number, uh, item number i that we looked for was assigned to uh, leaf number three, now the client assigns a new random leaf to that uh, 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 to that uh, item, say leaf number five, and it's going to store now the item in one of the leaves on the path from the root to leaf number five. Now, because the client assigned a totally random identity leaf to, the, to that item, okay, it cannot store a concise representation of, of the location of that item. I mean, it's not generated by a seed. It must store that location. So for this, the client has the position map so the client essentially goes to the position map and updates the location of item number zero from being in location zero, uh, three to being in location five. Uh, so it updates the position map. And then the last thing that the client does, it writes the updated item back to the root, okay? So it puts the item in the root, 
And hopefully, we'll have enough room in the root to put the item there. There's log n space there. OK, and note that these operations are oblivious. So what did we do here? So the client went, you know, search, uh, read the nodes in a path from the uh, root to a random leaf, read all the values in, the, in these nodes, and then wrote something to the uh, root, uh, to the root node. OK? And the next time we're going to look for this item, OK, item number zero, it's going to be assigned to a different no, a different leaf. So the client is going to look at a different path to, to a different uh, leaf, OK? So everything here should be oblivious. Yeah? So for now, let's just assume that the clients, each node has login items, and the client just reads all of the items there. OK. Now, obviously, there's a problem, as usual, in these schemes. No, we write. Everything ends with writing something to the root. The root has log n space, and then the root gets full. Okay, after log n times, the root gets full, and we don't want that to happen. So instead of working like Goldrich and Ostrovsky, which had a very structured way of moving items from uh, higher levels to, to lower levels, the approach by these schemes is, is probabilistic. I mean, they pick at random nodes uh, whose contents will be moved to lower levels. And hopefully, if the math works out and probabilities work, work out, we we'll have you know, enough, you know, enough room at the, at, 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 the, at, the, at the root to store everything. So here's how you prevent overflows. You uh, perform evictions. So in each level, you choose two nodes at random. So let's look, say, at this level. You choose two nodes completely at random. The client chooses two nodes at random. And then for each node, it pops an item. It reads one item from the bucket, if that bucket is not empty. And then that item, well, it, it, it belongs to a path that goes through this node and goes down here. So this item can be moved to the next node in its path, which is either this node or that node. So we take that item, and the client writes it to the next node to which that item should belong. Now, obviously, the client wants to hide from the server that it's moving an item, say, from this node to the one on its right. Because doesn't want to tell the server that you know I'm moving now an item which is mapped to this or that leaf. So what the client does, it writes, it reads one item from the node, and then it writes items to both nodes which are the uh, descendants, the the sons, the immediate sons of that node. Okay, and it always writes them in the same order, first to the left node, then to the right node. So in one of these write operations, you actually write an item. In the other operation, you just uh, uh, do in dummy operations. You don't write anything, but it seems like you're writing. You read some encrypted node, you move everything back in. OK? And you do it in each, in each level. You choose two nodes, and, and you do that. OK? So oh, look, the, OK, so in, in, in the, obviously in the root level, OK, you have to choose each two nodes in each, in each level. So you always pick the root, OK, and move something down. In the second level, you pick both nodes. I'm not sure if both nodes or you pick you know, two at random. But no, you, you pick different two nodes in each level, and, and, and so on. Okay? So obviously, the root doesn't get full. You always move things from the root downwards. Okay? But the question is, if, if, if we repeat this, okay, if we actually you know, uh, move enough things downwards so that not, no, no node will get full, OK? So one thing to note is these operations are oblivious. I kind of do the security proof as I'm showing. And these operations are oblivious because the, the client picks two nodes at random in each level, reads the contents, decrypts, write back new decrypted values to, that, to the nodes so the server doesn't know if it took something out or not, and then writes something you know, in, the, in an encrypted way to both sons. So everything is uh, oblivious and easily simulatable. Now, why? OK, so everything is simulatable, and everything works well as long as no buffer overflows. And the eviction somehow ensure this, and the analysis is based on apparently uh, quite ba basic uh, Markov chains. So look at the specific buffer, uh, a specific node at level i. What's the probability that, OK, how do items get into that buffer? By evicting them from the top layer, from the exact you know, father of that node in the higher level. So this node is in level i. His father is in level i minus 1. In that level, there are 2 to the power of i minus 1 uh, nodes. We pick two of them. So the probability of choosing the father is 2 over 2 to the power of i minus 1. We picked an item from there. The probability that that item is mapped to our node in location i is 1 half. 
So overall, the probability of getting an item map to uh, move to a uh, node in location i is 1 over 2 to the power of i minus 1. Now, we also evict I uh, items from the nodes in, in level i. What's the probability of us evicting an item from that node? Okay. So the probability of choosing this node to be evicted, we choose two items, two nodes in that level. The level has 2 to the i nodes. So the probability is 2 over 2 to the i, which is exactly the same probability of uh, inserting items to that, to that node. So we have the probability of putting items in a node is exactly the same as uh, taking items out of the node. And if you do this um, Markov chain analysis, you get the probability of uh, uh, a node becoming full is small. So that's the basic scheme. It's actually very nice. And then we can slightly improve it using uh, recursion. So one thing to note is when the client, you can use recursion in, in, two, in, in, in two ways. One is that the client reads items from each node. Okay? So a node has login items. It can read log, all login items in a node. Uh, however, it can also use ORAM to read the items from the node. So in, implement another ORAM in each node. Okay? Instead of reading the login items, use the other ORAM uh, uh, by induct inductively to read or recursively to read from there. Obviously, it's, no, we have constants. It's, it won't work too. I mean, it, it's, it's nice to get a nice uh, asymptotic overhead. It's not something. Uh, uh, you know, it's not practical to do it, at least more, not more than doing it just, just once, say, one level of precaution. OK, but, but you can do that. Another thing where you can use recursion is with that position map. So we recall that I said that the client has to store n log n bits. And this actually, that's not oblivious RAM. It, it has to have order of I mean, more than n data items. Uh, and, but what the client can do, it can use uh, it doesn't have to store this position map on the client. It can store it on the server. Okay? So uh, in the basic scheme I described, the client stores n log in, n, log n bits uh, you know, internally. Instead, it can store them at the server. Now, this n times log n bits fit into much less than n blocks. Okay? Suppose that the block is, I don't know, a few kilobytes long. Okay? You can put a lot of indices. Each of them is of length. Uh, log n into that block. Okay, the factor, you know, the number of blocks is reduced if you store the indices in blocks, is reduced by a factor of the size of the block over log n. Okay, so to store the position map at the at, at the server, you can do it using much less blocks than uh, uh, to store the initial data. So now the client doesn't have to uh, store the position map internally; it stores it at the uh, at the server. Then if it wants to learn the location to which a specific item is read, but it cannot read it internally, it has to access the server using this recursive call to an oblivious RAM and read it from there. Now, for this recursive call for an oblivious RAM, the client stores also needs to store a position map. Okay? Uh, for the oblivious RAM with which it stores the first position map on the server, uh, so it also takes some storage of the client, but uh, also that position map can be stored at the server recursively, and so on and so on. So if we do it uh, log n levels, we end up with the client storing uh, a constant amount of, 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 of memory. Uh, this is going to increase the overall overhead by a factor of log n. Uh, obviously, if you're going to implement this, you're not going to you know, do log n levels of the recursion. You're going to be much less as to just to as much uh, as you need. What's the overhead? So for the basic scheme, the server storage is O n times log n. The client stores n indices, so it's n times log n bits. And each access takes log squared with write operations. Now, if suppose instead of reading the entire you know, buckets of size log n for internal uh, uh, nodes, we use, say, the square root of um, which is not cheating too much, then instead of reading log n, values from each bucket, we can do it using uh, square root log n uh, 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 operations. And then we can reduce the cost from uh, log square to log to the power of 1.5. Yeah? That, you mean that each node is going to have square root n? Bits? Yeah, so each node, I said I can replace each node with an ORAM. But it's, it's not practical. So you could use it, we can replace it with a full ORAM, but like this is 
it's not cheating. Asymptotically, you, you get better results than uh, this. Uh, uh, than this. Yeah, the square root is pretty efficient. This is also square root. So when you request to use this, is it good in performance? I haven't implemented, I haven't checked, but they, you know, the, this was actually quite perfected over the last year or two, so I'm not sure what's the best thing to do. I think it's best just to read every, no, no. Okay, so actually, like in a minute, I'm going to show you another scheme which has, uh, which stores buckets of size four in each node. So all this is just, you know, theoretical, well, this was you know, interesting like two years ago. Now it's less interesting. Okay. Uh, we move, we do, we're moving this log n factor. Uh, OK, and if you want to store the position map at the server, so if I use an ORAM to do it, I reduce the client storage to uh, be constant, but the overhead increases by a factor of uh, uh, log n. So say by not cheating too much, I get uh, like overhead of uh, log uh, to the power of 2.5 and uh, accesses to the server per, uh, per each read-write operation. And it's a very simple, you know, it's a very simple uh, 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 scheme. It's easy to implement. And I guess, like, I guess most clients can store you know, a pretty big uh, 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 position map internally. So it's actually something you can do in practice. Now, there have been lots of. Uh, uh, Lots of work, work following up on this. Uh, they were tweaking the construction in, in many ways. Uh, there are different variants. Uh, one option is to think of clients with, with small storage or large memory storage. If the client has a large storage, you can store the position map and even more data at the client. Uh, if the client, suppose, can store login data items, you can do all kinds of nice things. Also, you can think of uh, blocks, the blocks being small or large. If the blocks are large, you can do other things than if the blocks are small, and so on. So there are different papers on all of these variants. And the most promising scheme is Spatio RAM, which achieve, achieves uh, an overhead of only a log n factor uh, you know, blow up per, uh, uh, per each read write operation. Okay? Uh, the client has to store log n items, and it only works with pretty large data items. Okay, and everything is kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it's well defined. And it's very efficient. It was even implemented in hardware. Okay? So it's like you think about really implementing chips where you access the RAM and uh, you hide which items you access using this technology. So just give you some ideas about how it works. So it's, it's basically the tree based scheme I described, just the eviction procedure is different. So instead of the eviction procedure picking two items at random, and moving uh, two nodes at random and moving the items one level back. Then here, essentially, if you search for the uh, item in a certain path from the root to the node, uh, as you search, you take all the items along that path and you try to push them downwards as much as possible. So suppose as I search for the item, I find some you know, value in, in a node at level two. As I go down along the, uh, along the path, yeah. I try to move it as much as possible downwards. I store it at the client and try to move it downwards. This requires the client to store login items, OK? Because well, this is why the client has to store login items. However, this aggressive uh, uh, policy of pushing things downwards results in very small buckets. Because as I push things downwards in the tree, well, recall that in each level, I have more buckets, OK? So as I push things downwards, uh, I'll store you know, the same number of items in, in more buckets. In each level, as I go down, I have more buckets. So the levels are going to be less occupied. And they showed here the analysis was pretty uh, you know, complicated, but it was shown that you can work well with buckets of size 4. Okay. Actually, in, in most of these schemes, I think that they started with uh, you know, had an idea, and then they uh, uh, simulated it. You know. No, they, they, they saw what the parameters should be, and then they did an analysis to prove that they can achieve something like that, okay? which is a good, a good policy. You ask if the probability of if the probability of something bad happening is negative. I'm not sure. I, I didn't check the details. Uh, I don't know. 
Like, I mean, you so I, the, so I, I, the analysis checks the probability of having more than four, than having a bucket with more than four items. Uh, they show this to happen with uh, low, small probability. I'm not sure if small is negligible or not. Now, last thing I would like to mention is how to use ORAM for secure computation. I just I, actually I went a bit too fast in my talk. I just described the basic uh, basic ideas. Okay, uh, and recall, like in, for my talk in the first day, that the main problem we had with using circuits is indirect accesses to data. So if I want to access, say, location I in an array, and I want to use uh, an, a circuit for that, uh, I have to essentially touch in the circuits all the items in that array, which is pretty bad. It's, it's comparable to uh, an ORAM situation where I want to read an item from the server, and I'm reading all the data of the server back to the client and you know, to hide which item I'm, I'm, I'm trying to access. And, uh, and, and using ORAM for secure computation wants to solve that, to be able to read an item, uh, read an item from, you know, uh, from you know, do indirect addressing uh, while hiding uh, 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 which item I'm accessing. So this you know, technologies, I don't think that they are uh, efficient yet, uh, practically yet, but I'll describe the basic ideas. I'm just describing any interpretation of that technology, not necessarily what was uh, achieved. I'm re referring here to a uh, work of Lou and Ostrovsky. There are other results in that area. Okay, so I'll just give the, the interpretation. So suppose that uh, two parties want to securely compute a RAM program, and we can think of it as a Turing machine or as a RAM program. So what does the program has? So it has a state, and we're going to share the state between the two parties. There is a state machine which, based on the state and an item which is read from the RAM, from the memory, decides on the next state. And we can implement that state machine using a circuit. Okay? And then we also need to read or write something from the RAM or the Turing machine tape. Okay? So the first two items are pretty easy. I mean, the, the, the state can be shared by the parties, so it's hidden from the parties. The state machine, we can use a circuit to implement it, but accessing the RAM is the hard part. And you can do it in the following way. So suppose that one of the parties, P1, stores the uh, encrypted RAM, and P2 knows the key. So no one, none of them knows you know, the items in the RAM, uh, but they have to hide which items are accessed, because definitely if you know which items are accessed, say in the Turing machine, you know a lot about the computation. Okay? And the, then the program accesses the RAM using an ORAM, and the, the location to be accessed is a function of what? It's a function of the program state which is shared by the two parties, and of you know, the value which was read from the RAM, which can also be shared by the two parties. Okay? And there's a deterministic algorithm, okay, uh, which can be implemented, say, by a circuit. Okay? So think of, of a state machine. Okay? So there's a, an algorithm which decides which uh, location I want to read, to read next. Okay? And this algorithm gets as an input a state, something we read from the, serve, from, from the memory, and then it decides which, which item we, we want to read next from the server. Okay? Uh, so this algorithm is going to be what we previously called the client of the ORAM. Okay? So now the client of the ORAM is not going to be one of the, two of the two parties. It's going to be a secure computation which is run between the two parties. Okay? So what does this secure computation uh, does, it essentially, it wants to access an item, okay, in the memory, while hiding uh, which item, you know, it, it accesses. So it actually implements a, uh, an ORAM. So what does the circuit do? So think of any scheme I mentioned, say the uh, tree-based ORAM, okay? So this circuit gets us input, you know, from the two parties, and this, you know, state machine saying, you know, now we need to read location number 100 in the, in the memory, okay? And so the algorithm says, okay, start, you know, look at the, uh, 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 this position map, item 100 is mapped to uh, leaf number 17. Now st let's start reading these things. And essentially what the algorithm, what the circuit, what the secure computation does is ask the server to provide these leaves, uh, these nodes. Then it decrypts them. How can it decrypt something received from the, from the server? So as I said before, uh, the RAM is encrypted and, and stored at P1, and the decryption key is known to P2. So the secure computation can decrypt uh, what's available, what, what he just received. 
And then, you know, it can tweets the next uh, node, the next level, and so on. It does the evictions and so on, OK? So it seems like uh, a bit complicated to implement by, uh, by, by a secure computation. But if you think of it, the overhead of, you know, we have to access, you know, the number of times we have to access the, the RAM is uh, kind of polylogarithmic. And the overhead of implementing this computation is also polylogarithmic. And I know that uh, Abby worked with Elaine Shi and others on actually designing ORAM schemes which have a very small footprint as circuits. So uh, when they thought about uh, designing ORAM for this purpose of secure computation, so basically the, the, the work of the client is implemented by a circuit. So now the, the, like the metric they had was not implement, uh, uh, reducing you know, the number of times we have to access the, 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 the server, but rather the, how uh, hard it is for a circuit to compute the work of the client in the oblivious one, okay? And they, had, they have a construction which is supposed to somehow optimize, minimize, and I guess there's still more work coming to uh, minimize the, the, the size of circuits implementing the oblivious one. So I'll conclude. So OAM, you know, it was an amazing achievement. Uh, the area has been very quiet for many years, and then in recent years there have been a you know, a wave of, of results in that area, and it seems to be coming quite, uh, quite efficient and, and, and becoming very close to being practical. Uh, so the, it's, it's very hard to follow up with recent research. So I just counted in 2014, I think there were four, 14 manuscripts which had oblivious RAM or OAM in the title or in the content. I think in the title. So, okay, that's, it's very hard to be up to date with everything that's happening here, and I didn't attempt to be. Uh, up to date, just to give you the basic constructions. I think that uh, at least most constructions you see, most constructions in, in those 14 papers followed one of the schemes I described uh, today. Most of them followed the, the, last, uh, the last type of schemes. And uh, that's it. And I think there's still lots to come in uh, OVAM uh, research. OK, <laughs> questions? Uh, what do you know about uh, lower bounds? Lower bounds. So we know lower bounds, but I didn't check uh, events. You know. Log n, or I think that log n, yeah, it's definitely log n. There's a recent paper. The probability, whenever you say negligible, I kind of, I'm not sure because unless you read the details, you know, without reading the details of each proof, you won't be sure if it's negligible or not. Uh, this, no, it's definitely not constant, but it might be one of a poly and uh, probability of things going bad. But usually they do simulations to make sure that everything's, everything's nice. Yeah? I think you said that the cat OVAM was going to ask these items. What, what was it? Uh, you said the path OVAM works for large state items. So why does path OVAM works for large? So. OK, I'm, I'm not sure about the exact answer. But basically, with all of these uh, 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 schemes, you do the prob probabilistic analysis. And you get uh, some expression which depends on the size of the you know, things that you want to store. And so some of these expressions work for large uh, blocks, and some of them works I mean, there are some papers where they have like different asymptotic overhead for large or small blocks, depending on how they, they define large or small. But I cannot recall the, well, the exact reason now. OK, thanks. <laughs>